So the whole point of this equation here was to show how this buffer solution will prevent the pH from changing. The whole point of this example is to show how it will prevent the pH from changing because normally, we would normally expect that if you add sulfuric acid, you would normally expect that to decrease the pH, right? Normally when you add sulfuric acid, you expect that to decrease the pH. We saw how that worked in pure water in this equation here. If you just add sulfuric acid to pure water, it directly decreases the pH in line with uh, because all the sulfuric acids deprotonate once. However, we saw in this equation that when we add the sulfuric acid to this buffer, well, based on this equation, it looks like we're not producing any hydroniums. Yeah. Okay. Now, like I said, that's uh, kind of uh, uh, a little bit misleading. If, if we were going to look at this in more detail, we would see that there will be some more hydroniums, but not very much. Certainly, um, we certainly are not going to say that each of these sulfuric acids is going to produce a hydronium like it would down here. So the pH here is going to be approximately constant. It will decrease, but not decrease by much. And the purpose of this example, again, is to show how a buffer prevents changes in pH. And the basic idea is the way it does it is by sponging up any acid that you add. Normally, adding an acid to a solution would produce hydronium, but here we're not producing hydronium because the sulfuric acid is getting sponged up by the acetate. So, to proceed, uh, all right, so uh, now there's still something else that we have to do in our demonstration here. Let's see what would happen if we added sodium hydroxide to this buffer solution. Let's see what would happen if we added sodium hydroxide to this buffer solution. So, try writing down the chemical equation for what will happen if we add sodium hydroxide to this buffer solution uh, acetic acid and acetate. Now, who is the sodium hydroxide going to react with? Well, remember that if there's nobody for it to react with, it'll just react with water. But it would prefer to react with uh, a better acid than water. Well, are there any acids around here? Well, yes, we have our acetic acid. So rather than react with the water, the sodium hydroxide, just as you have written down, will react with this acetic acid. You wouldn't expect it to react with the acetate because a base wants to react with an acid. Now, let's think pretty carefully about what's going to happen here. What is this acetic acid going to do? Well, it's going to protonate this over here. Uh, so what happens when, after this protonates? Well, that just leaves acetate over here. So that would leave us with acetate on the right-hand side. Now, who exactly is this protonating? Well, it's really protonating this OH group, right? This is really going to protonate the OH group. Well, how many hydrogens will this OH group have after it's protonated? Two. In fact, what molecule would the hydroxide be after you protonate it? What molecule would we get? It'll be water. So I think what you originally wrote down, I think you originally wrote down that this was going to be one of the products, that this would be the product. But actually, um, this is what happens when we protonate water. But we're not protonating water here, we're protonating hydroxide, basically. It might have helped. It might have helped to show the charges on this originally. This is really a nonic compound. What we started with here was not water. We started with hydroxide. Well, when you protonate hydroxide, you don't get hydronium. You get neutral water. OK, so we should say that we're producing water here. And then we just have the sodium lying around as a spectator ion. The sodium is not participating. It's just a spectator ion. The most elegant place to put the sodium is as a counter ion to the acetate over here. So now we can say we produced sodium acetate over here. Usually, uh, so what, what, what do you do with your spectator ions? We well, just draw them next to whoever has a charge. So originally it was the hydroxide that had the charge. 
but now it's the acetate that has the charge, so the most elegant thing to do is to write the sodium over here. Okay. All right, so this would give us our two products here. Um, so the two products here are the sodium acetate and water. Now, my question to you is, as a result of this reaction, based on what I have written on the board, does it look like the pH has gone up, gone down, or stayed the same? It looks like it stayed the same, because it doesn't look like we produced any hydroxides here. So again, we would expect the pH is approximately constant. Again, the whole point of this is just to demonstrate how buffers work. It's to demonstrate how buffers prevent the pH from changing. So again, we're seeing how the buffer is succeeding in preventing the pH from changing. And again, it does that by acting like a sponge. Mm -hmm. This uh, acetic acid here is just soaking up any base that you add. We yeah. compare that to what would happen if we were not buffered. If we were not buffered, the sodium hydroxide would just directly produce hydroxides, mm -hmm. which would directly make the solution more basic. If there was no buffer, this would just yeah. dissociate and produce hydroxide. But this acts like a sponge that's basically sponging up the hydroxide mm -hmm. and preventing the pH from changing. Okay, so again, what we're trying to show here is just this basic intuition that a buffer prevents the change in pH by acting like a sponge. It sponges up any acid that you add, and it also sponges up any base that you add. Uh, and again, uh, this equation I run here is, a is not totally accurate. The pH wouldn't really be totally constant. The pH would go up a little, but just by a little. But it certainly wouldn't go up nearly as much as if there was no buffer. And the same deal here. In this case, the pH wasn't really constant. In this case, the pH um, actually went down, even though the equation makes it look like it didn't. The pH actually would go down, but only a little. So we, we don't need to go into the details for why we actually do change the pH a little bit. But it's kind of intuitive that if you add uh, an acid, you would expect some effect. Um, uh, on the uh, pH. If you add this, you can expect some effect. The sponge is not perfect. The sponge is actually not going to completely sponge up any uh, hydronium or hydroxides. But certainly the pH is not going to change nearly as much as it would here. Uh, if there was no buffer, then every single acid molecule would contribute a hydronium, or every single strong base would contribute a hydroxide. Whereas here, um, almost uh, the large majority of the hydronium and the hydroxide are getting sponged up. Okay. Uh, so again, the purpose here is just to show how a buffer works. Okay, and now we can see why to make a buffer, you need both an acid and a base. Right. Because if we only had the acid, then we couldn't have sponged up this, uh, we couldn't have sponged up this acid over here. Mm -hmm. If we'd only put in the acetic acid, there would have been nothing to sponge up this sulfuric acid. We needed the, the base, the, the weak conjugate base here, to sponge up the sulfuric acid. Right. And by the same token, you can see why um, we needed uh, uh, to put in the uh, acetic acid as well, because we needed that to sponge up this base. Right. All right, so then you can see why we need both an acid and its conjugate base, or both the base and its conjugate acid. You need the acid to, to sponge up any base that you might be adding, and you need the base to sponge up any acid that you might be adding. So you can see why we need both of those. Okay. okay. All right, and also very briefly, we can see why these have to be weak in order to work. The reason they have to be weak is because, remember, if one of them was strong, the other one wouldn't really be acidic or basic at all. If, uh, if, uh, if, so we have to use a weak acid here, because if we were using a strong acid, its conjugate wouldn't really be basic at all, and then it couldn't sponge anything up. So suppose we tried to make a buffer. So here would be a bad buffer, a buffer that doesn't work. Suppose we tried to make a buffer out of hydrochloric acid, and chloride. Suppose we tried to make a buffer out of hydrochloric acid and chloride. So this is, uh, we're just going to suppose we try to make a buffer out of this and show why it doesn't work. We're going to show why this buffer would not work. Okay? Okay. Well, why would it work? Well, the reason it won't work is, remember, this chloride, even though it's the conjugate of this acid, this chloride isn't really basic at all. Even though we call it the conjugate base of the hydrochloric acid, we saw before it's not really basic at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we went through a whole argument for why the conjugate of a strong acid is really not basic at all, because otherwise it, it couldn't be possible for the hydrochloric reaction to go to completion with water. If this is going to completely deprotonate, then this can't protonate at all. When we say this completely deprotonates, what we mean is that this doesn't protonate at all. 
If this was protonating somewhat, then this couldn't be completely deprotonated over here. So this is really not basic at all. But that means we can't use it to sponge up any acid that we might add. If something is not basic at all, it won't work as a sponge to sponge up any acid that we might add. So suppose we tried to add sulfuric acid to this. Well, if we tried adding sulfuric acid to this, the chloride would not sponge it up because the chloride is really not uh, basic at all. So um, we really uh, so this would not work as a sponge, and therefore this would not work as a buffer. We need both the acid and its conjugate uh, to be acidic and basic enough that they can act as sponges for any additional acid or base that you might add.